All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll uh, let people trickle in here for a minute or so and then get the show on the road. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to put your check-in into the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from and maybe how the weather is there. It's uh, snowing pretty hard in Madison, Wisconsin on this ninth day of January. This is really our, our first big snow of the winter. We're expecting as much as eight or nine inches out of this. Um, we'll see what we get out of it so far. But I uh, hope everyone's had great holidays and uh, a good start to the new year. And we've got a, an exciting program to kick off our Zoom series uh, today for you. And uh, as I say, we'll get that started here in, in just a minute or so as, as uh, guests continue to, to fill in. And always nice to see all those names popping up in the in the attendee panel. And uh, and I see we've got a, a couple of check-ins already from, from George uh, in rainy Virginia and Elrond out in uh, rainy California. I guess we're... Uh, how's the weather in, in Scotland today, Peter? Overcast. Uh, as, <laughs> I'm, as one would I'm, expect. <laughs> I'm very, very cold. Uh, but no, not New York cold. This is uh, Scotland cold. Right. <laughs> it's a different kind of cold. Yeah, yeah. That's unmanageable. <laughs> All right, well, we're, we're trickling up close to, to 50 on the attendance, and uh, we're at 12.02 here in Central Time Zone. So I'll go ahead and get started with our quick introduction and, and then turn it over to, to Peter for our program today. So uh, again, Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Scott Lotus, President and Executive Director of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our first Zoom program of 2024, a uh, year I'm still uh, trying to calibrate myself to say consistently. It's also our first program without uh, our, our former exhibitions and events uh, manager, Haley Page. Uh, we already miss her a great deal and we'll ask for your patience as we're all kind of reteaching ourselves how to, how to do these Zoom programs on this end, uh, but so far so good. As most of you know, the Center for Robert Photography and Art is a nonprofit arts and organ, uh, arts and education organization based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we have a but we're a national and even international in scope, uh, with a mission to preserve and present significant images of railroading. Uh, many of our image collections contain photographs taken by American photographers of railroads all over the world, and so it's exciting for me to be able to to showcase. Uh, someone from another country looking at a facet of rail transportation here in the United States. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, in the meantime, know that the center uh, has an archive of uh, nearly half, well, actually more than half a million images and a number that continues to grow. You can find many of those uh, available through our website and our Odyssey platform. Uh, we're at railphoto-art.org. You can also find information there about our 2024 conference. Registrations for that will be opening next week, and that's going to be in June this year uh, in the Chicago area uh, here in the U.S. Um, we also publish our quarterly magazine, Railroad Heritage. We did have some delays in the shipping of that with the holiday season. Hopefully everyone's gotten it by now. If you haven't yet, uh, please be patient and, and let us know, and we'll make sure all of our members and subscribers get those uh, just as soon as we can get them out to you. Uh, our latest book, Rio Grande Steam Finale, is just down to a couple hundred copies left in our warehouse. So if you don't have that yet, I'd encourage you to order it soon if you'd like to get a copy. That's also available off of our website. Uh, and our monthly Zoom programs are available at our YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com slash railphotoart. We'll be posting this presentation there in a week or so where anyone can go back and view it later. And you can go back through and see uh, most of our programs on YouTube. We have more than 60 posted there. Uh, we'll continue uh, doing these on a monthly basis this year, except for June, when we'll be focused on our annual conference. Our next YouTube present or our Zoom presentation will be uh, one of our members only shows. That's going to be on February 20th, uh, Tuesday evening. And I'll be sharing selections and highlights from our Fred Springer collection, one of the first big photography collections we took on at the center and, and uh, a collection that really allowed us to begin the professionalization of our archives program. It'll be fun to share some of that history with you as well as some of Fred's incredible photographs. So I look forward to seeing you for that on February 20th. Um, Without further ado right now, I'd like to go ahead and, and turn the screen over to our presenter today, Peter Lloyd, uh, with just a brief introduction for him. Uh, he's in his day job, he is a software developer in Inverness, Scotland, but he has a real passion for the New York subway system, and particularly its maps. Uh, he's even written a book about, uh, about those. It's called Vignelli Transit Maps, uh, based on the, the very well-known map of the New York subway uh, by uh, designer uh, Massimo Vignelli. Uh, 
Peter's the expert on all of this. You can learn more about his research at his website, which is peterbloyd.com. He's also on social media at NYC Subway Map on Facebook, Instagram, and some of the other platforms there. Uh, so Peter, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, go ahead and take it away. Thanks very much, Scott. All right, let's try and share the screen. Right. So this is about one aspect of the subway, um, the map, and one aspect of the map, namely the color coding, which has gone through a number of different uh, evolutionary stages over the past um, 120 odd years. Now we're all very familiar, anyone who's been to New York will be very familiar with the map as it is now, but how did it get these colors? How do the lines acquire the colors they have now? What's the story behind them? Well, the colors have evolved over a number of years. I mean, many different varieties of designs of map. Um, people have got different ideas about how to design the map, how to put the colors to use. And so what I'll be doing is going through this um, sequence of, of uh, maps and the evolution of them and to try and explain some of the ideas that have gone into the map. Now, just a bit of background to begin with, the timeline of the New York subway. It started in 1904 with the Independent Rapid Transit uh, Corporation, uh, the IRT, as we always call it. A bit later on, we have the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit, the BMT, and then the IND, the independent system. So those three operating companies um, ran the subway for um, half of the last century until eventually they were brought together, at least administratively, uh, in 1940 under the Board of Transportation. Uh, later on, the BMT and IND were physically linked together uh, as the IRT still remained separate. Um, in terms of the companies that were running it, the IRT ran its own system, the BMT, and the IND was run by the Board of Transportation, uh, the, the civil authority in New York. The Board of Transportation then took over BMT and IRT, and later was replaced by the Transit Authority, which later became subsumed under the MTA. So it's quite a alphabet soup of different designations, and it can get a bit complex, so I just thought I'd give you this diagram to begin with, so you have some orientation as to what all these abbreviations are. Uh, the map itself has changed a lot, as I said. Uh, so in the early days, we have a um, map. Well, the first one, let's just go back one second. We don't know who designed this one. Um, there are lots of mysteries in the evolution of the subway map, and that is one of them. Who designed this first map? Nobody knows. Uh, not really sure who designed the next one. It might have been a guy called John Greve. Um, he fits the bill, but there's no documentary evidence to prove it. The next one, George Plackey definitely designed the, um, the BMT map because he put his name on it. Uh, Arthur Windoff almost certainly did the IND map. Uh, then we get into much more certainty. Andrew Hagstrom definitely designed the Hagstrom map. And then we have Stephen Verheis, who became the official uh, map um, creator for the TA for a number of years. And then we had George Salomon, Diagram, Raleigh Jadama's color coding, and the very famous Massimo Vignani. And finally, John Torex, who brought in a different concept of how to use the colors. So part one, two color maps. In 1904, when the IRT opened, uh, it published this commemorative book. It wasn't really meant for public sale. It was meant for VIPs or people, um, thought influencers, as we call them now. Um, but it had the first colored rail um, subway map using this scheme of red for the subway system and blue for the elevated. It's uh, an exquisitely beautiful map. Uh, you may well have seen the uh, reprint of this from the 60s, if you can get hold of the original copy from 1904, you'll see what an exquisitely beautiful map this is. Uh, zooming in, we can see that um, it shows the individual tracks, not just the lines. And this is part of the uh, suggestion that it wasn't actually meant as a passenger map. It was meant to indicate 
the assets. So if you were a potential investor, you could see how many power stations you're getting, how many lines were being built by the money. This is probably the first uh, station map, the first passenger map meant to help people find their way around the system. This is held by the New York Public Library. And when the BMT started, they created a new map. They hired a young guy called George Plackey, a uh, Hungarian emigre. Uh, this is almost certainly his first job. He's only 17 at the time he drew this map, and it then lasted for a few decades. Uh, it's quite an, an abstracted map. Uh, we see no streets or other topographical information on the background, but it shows quite clearly the BMT lines. One clear absence from it is the IRT. Even though the IRT was there, been there since 1904, um, the BMT being a competitor ignored its existence. So just as the um, IRT ignored the BMT, the BMT ignored the IRT. Uh, you can see here that we have two different colors, um, red for the elevated lines and black for the subway lines. It's um, an arbitrary uh, difference from the previous map, uh, but it does show that uh, colors were being used um, this is in the early days of printing before we had four color lithographic printing presses. So uh, there was a limit on how many colors you could get onto these maps that cost. And interestingly, he uses red for above ground, even when it's a bridge, whereas the tunnels are black. The IRT suddenly realized that the BMT were getting ahead of them in producing pocket maps, which they didn't have before. And so they uh, commissioned somebody, possibly John Grieve, to create this map. Again, it's for the similar principle. Um, street details are uh, abstracted out, and we just see the lines. But now we see um, a different use of colors, red for subway, blue for elevated, and then some lines uh, have both subway and elevated uh, trains on them, and the broken line for the under construction. So again, this is still um, using colors for uh, elements of a given network. It's not using being used to distinguish different networks. Uh, the two networks ignore each other. So here we see on the BMT one, red is elevated. On the IRT, red is subway. There's no real logic to it. And if we zoom in, we can see that the certain lines, which are red and blue, as I said, because they got uh, cars from both uh, the subway and the elevated systems running along them. The IND was a much simpler system, just a single color of black. Uh, over the years, the network grew more and more and more uh, until we reach a point where it gets a bit too complex to show all of the uh, information on a single black line. And so Arthur Weindorf um, came up with a very clever idea of separating out the routes. This idea was subsequently lost and rediscovered many years later in the 60s. Uh, so this was an innovation, but an innovation that went down a blind alley of evolution. At this point, the lines obviously are not colored. They're just indicated in the key in the bottom right corner. Um, and they show the different end-to-end -end routes that form part of the IND system. And he is following a rule that Vignelli later um, expressed by saying, no dot, no stop. And we can see here at uh, 23rd Street, two of the routes have got dots, meaning that the train stops there, and the other two routes, there's no dot, so the train doesn't stop, it just passes by. In other words, these are express routes that are running past that station. And in order to see what each line, what route each line represents, you have to go to the terminal, and here we see letter A indicating that line is the, uh, the A train. Uh, you, you can't see that information along the line itself. Shortly afterwards, Weindorf uh, devised a color version of the same map. And now you can see uh, from the line itself, from its color, which line is which. There's a key in the bottom right corner. So you don't have to trace your way through the, uh, the map to find the terminal. You can see immediately the red is the A train. Uh, and so on. So this is a use of color to indicate the route, and it's very effective in showing information, which was there previously, it was there in the black and white map, 
but much more legible, much more easy to read. Weindorf uh, continued for a bit longer in the um, IND system. He devised this map, which was, I believe, part of his plan to completely uh, rejig the entire network on the basis of colored routes. So each end-to-end -end route would have its own color, and he's really expanding it into lines which or routes which didn't exist at the time, but were anticipated. So you can see there are far more routes in this map than the previous one. Um, and, and this is really uh, very far-sighted. Uh, this level of complexity and packaging route information in one map wasn't seen again until the 70s. And zooming in, you can see just how um, sophisticated, really, that this map is in terms of its clarity of using um, vertical bars to indicate stations and, and different colors and so on. And if we compare uh, these three versions of Weindorf's map, you can see how his ideas are evolving. The earliest one, 1938, uh, was the black and white. Then he added the colors, and then he started adding more lines in which he expected to be built, and it became a very complex map. Now, there were three operating companies, as we mentioned. There's the IRT, the BMT, and the IND, each with their own separate map, which excluded all the others. And this created an opportunity for... That shouldn't be, that should it's going out of the way. Okay. Um, it created an opportunity for uh, innovative people uh, to create a combined map that gave the passengers information about all the different networks rather than just one network. And Andrew Hangstrom was both a great cartographer and a really ruthless businessman. Uh, he uh, didn't hesitate to sue people who stole his ideas, but he was also um, really pushed forwards with uh, a clear map. And this was his map. He, he started doing maps in 1916, um, kind of incidentally from his main business, which was uh, printing and drafting. Uh, he made a map to help people find his office, found it was very successful, started producing more of them, and he really produced a much clearer map than anybody else, and hence got ahead of all other map makers in the New York area. And in 1933, he took advantage of new printing presses to produce his color map with um, his three color scheme. In other words, um, each of the lines, each of the operating companies has its own color. And this was introduced in 1933, 36. And 10 years on, his maps were adopted by the Board of Transportation as the official maps. Now here you can see his color scheme is used to indicate not the individual routes, but the, <clears throat> pardon me, um, the operating companies. So the IND is red, IRT is blue, and the BMT at first was orangey, uh, and later became yellow. And there were certain um, lines which uh, allowed both the IRT and BMT to run along at the same time, but without actual interlocking. And then the elevated, as you may recall, the earliest map in 1904, the elevated lines were uh, shown in the same thickness, same size, uh, subway lines. Now they shrunk down to this skinny little black line, not very uh, prominent at all. And if we zoom into mid Manhattan, you can see uh, it's really a very clear use of color to separate out the different uh, companies. Uh, as we've now got all three companies on one map, there's a lot of information being compressed into um, Manhattan. Manhattan has uh, got a bit fat. This isn't really how big Manhattan is, it's really much skinnier than that. So he's brought in Manhattan and used this very clear indication with, uh, you may notice, uh, black edging along each of the lines and very strong primary colors separating out the different lines. And you can see how the color coding has evolved. We have the early one with elevated as red, then subways as red, and then uh, wind off uh, different color for each end-to-end uh, -end route, and then Hagstrom moved back in a way and had a different color for each operating company. Now, there's a question here as to why did the Board of Transportation choose a simple three-color map by a private company 
rather than the more sophisticated polychromatic map by its own innovative designer, Weindorf. It seems a bit of a, a regressive uh, move to take uh, a very information rich map and replace it with a much simpler one. Well, partly for simplicity, but also um, out of sheer business acumen. Now, during the World War II, uh, our, um, Andrew Hagstrom was working for the Navy, the US Navy, and produced weather resistant naval charts. And at the end of the war, he was given a $70,000 contract by the uh, Board of Transportation to produce a subway map which would resist weather and vandalism and anything else. People threw it. It was a melamine map. Um, the same design as his paper maps, but uh, printed on a very hard board. And these were then uh, installed in every subway station around the entire network. And that was 1947. And shortly after, he had a contract for putting them in every subway car. And it seems as if that was the, uh, the winning advantage that Hagstrom had, that he was able to offer the Board of Transportation this weather-resistant map he had printing presses all ready to run with this, and um, that was an advantage that Windoff didn't have. So Windoff had the great idea of these different color for each route, but Hagstrom said, no, I can give you a map right here, right now, and I can print it on this weather-resistant board, and so he got the contract. But he was an outside entity. He was external to the Board of Transportation. In 1952, when his maps have been running for a while, uh, there's an internal memo at the board saying that they were weary of being at the mercy and monopoly of a private map maker. The following year, uh, the Transit Authority took over from the board and they followed up this idea of moving away from the Hagstrom map. So the following year, they started issuing maps designed by a guy called Stephen Vorheis, which is printed with promotional material from the Union Dime Savings Bank and hence free of charge, whereas Hagstrom charged for his maps, uh, the Union Dime Saving Savings Bank did not because it had their advertising on. So that brings us up to the um, mid-50s. Uh, I can see on this um, scheme. Uh, what happens next is that a young emigre called George Salomon, who had spent time in London and really liked the way that the London tube map by Harry Beck had been designed, and he was nagging the new transit authority to create a map um, in a similar diagrammatic form. And eventually um, they accepted it. So in 1955, Salomon was ahead of his time. He proposed a comprehensive redesign of wayfinding signage, rather like what Unimark did in the 60s, a diagrammatic map of the subway, like Vignelli's in the 70s, and a trunk-based color scheme like John Tornet's in the late 70s. Now, what I mean by a trunk-based scheme is rather than each end-to-end -end route having a separate color, each of the main trunks going down Manhattan has a color, and that then branches out into the different lines. We'll see in a moment. Now, how much of this did the Transit Authority accept? Well, not very much. Uh, in 55, 56, he submitted two long proposals to the Transit Authority. And here we can see an illustration of his trunk color scheme. So each um, trunk, in this case represented by E, the letter, so each trunk had its own letter as well as color, um, then had a number of branches. All the branches uh, would go out in the same color and they'd be named by E1, E2, E3, E4. And we see here the list of the trunks going down Manhattan. Lexington Avenue was going to be blue, Broadway, darker blue. Sixth Avenue was, some of the colors are a bit faded, I think crimson, Seventh Avenue red, and Eighth Avenue green. And this is a brilliant idea, but it would involve changing all the signage at the same time. And the Transit Authority really did not want to make that big investment. And so this idea was ignored for a number of decades. Uh, yeah, so zooming in, you can see each of the five trunks has its own color, its own letter. Uh, a brilliant scheme, but as I said, 
they didn't buy it. All they did accept was the idea of having a diagram as the map. Now here we have his hand-drawn uh, sketch using his five trunk colors. Uh, you can see here uh, blue going down Lexington Avenue, uh, red and green and so on. So this was how he wanted, how he envisaged the subway map to be. It's a very uh, parsimonious uh, scheme, uh, follows the modern notion of minimalism. Um, and the only part of this that the TA accepted was the fact that it was a diagram. They didn't want to change the colors. So uh, it went ahead and published this new map, which we see here. And as you can see, this is, does not use the uh, trunk color scheme. It goes back to the same Hagstrom notion of one color for each operating company. Uh, different colors, but still the principle is the same that we have um, to work out where each uh, train is going. So along here, uh, you can see that there are several branches feeding into Lexington Avenue and several branches coming out. Now, how do you know the train starting at this point goes to this branch rather than uh, a different branch. Well, you have to look at the table of information on the back of the map. You can't see that from the actual map itself. Whereas the, if it follows Solomon's concept of having each trunk having a letter and then numbered E1, E2 and so on, then we'd be able to work it out. And this was his color scheme. Uh, Red for IND as before, black for IRT, and green rather than yellow or orange for the BMT. Uh, and the, the reason for that mainly is uh, to avoid having to do edging. You can see in the Hagstone map, the yellow line, as it was after 46, uh, the yellow line's got two black edgings alongside it, because otherwise the yellow wouldn't be very visible. And George Salomon thought, well, I don't really want to clutter up the map with all these little edging lines. So he said, I'm changing the yellow to a green. They have a solid block of green to indicate the BMT. And he dispensed with this edging that uh, Hagstrom had used. Yeah, there you go. That's the, uh, and also it avoids the problem of, of uh, things being slightly misaligned here because the yellow doesn't quite match up with the black edging. Solomon didn't have that problem because he didn't have the black lines. And you can see if we zoom in, um, there's a lot of information there. It's quite clear. Maybe not as aesthetic as the uh, Hagstrom map, um, but still pretty useful. Uh, comparing one with the other. So on the left, we have uh, the 1930s. Um, the Jews, I think. Um, the the, Salmon, the, the uh, Hagstrom map on the left and the Salomon map on the right. Uh, Salomon needs to have um, a more expanded area because he's writing all the station names next to the stations, which is quite a useful feature. Whereas um, Hagstrom used to put the stations all over the place. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can see here that the indication of a um, transfer station uh, is, is uh, quite different. Uh, whereas Hagstrom had a, a lasso around the uh, complex, Salomon has a um, a, a beige um, block around it. So it's using color to indicate where the transfer stations are. Uh, that changed gradually over the years after um, George Salomon let go of the map, he handed it over to the TA. They started doing their own ideas and they put uh, yellow blocks around the transfer stations. They put uh, numerical indications of tourist attractions. And then in 1964, for the World's Fair, they put a, a rather ugly uh, large blue marker across it, which uh, Solomon hated, but couldn't do anything about it because he wasn't working for the TA. He simply provided the map in the first place. So again, we see the use of color to indicate a lot of different information, maybe too much information here, uh, yellow blocks for the transfer stations, yellow circles for the tourist attractions, and big blue line for the World's Fair, which we see zoomed in here, horrible thing, well, subjective. Um, root color maps. Now then, 1967 is going to be the big uh, watershed for the map design. Uh, but the story begins in 1957 when a two-mile tunnel under Christie Street in Chinatown 
was intended to alleviate congestion. It took them a decade to get it all built and opened. Uh, this is the uh, position of it. So um, we can see here that originally there was a, um, a red IND line coming down and two green BMTs. And they're going to build a new tunnel which connects together all three of these lines, which you see in yellow. And the problem for the cartographers, and, and the reason for this, as I said, is to reduce congestion, because there was a lot of congestion in certain parts of Netherwick, around the Calb Avenue, and to help to alleviate, to allow trains to run more easily through the system, this tunnel was built and connected the IND with the, uh, the BMT. But the problem for the map makers is what color to do it. So here we have uh, the so-called Christie Street connection, this two-mile tunnel uh, under Chinatown, shown in black. And the problem is, should that tunnel be red or green? Uh, you can see it's connecting a red line and two green lines. So what color should it be? If we follow this notion that um, we're using color only to indicate the operating company, and obviously the operating companies themselves had stopped being relevant in 1940 when all three of them came under the BOT, um, but the, the physical lines were still separate until November 1967, when the BMT and ID were physically uh, connected to allow into working. So 1964, they knew this was coming up, so they organized a subway map contest, a public competition, uh, which ended a few months later and had three winners. Uh, Riley Tadama, who was a solicitor, Harry Sheckman, who was a young kid, and Don Merrick, who were professional designers. Each of them submitted their own idea of a map of how the subway map should look. And Riley also submitted a report defining the principles on which his map was designed. Uh, that report was then passed to Stanley Goldstein, uh, a rocket scientist who produced a number of prototypes and a report which were then passed to Jerome Adler at the TA, who decided to um, override Stanley Goldstein and just merge two of his proposals. Not the best thing to do, but he did it. And then that was passed to Dante Calise in Diamond International to put it all together. What happened to the original maps? Well, they were filed away for a while and then trashed. So we do not have those original maps. We don't know what they look like um, with precision. Um, but uh, we do have an indication of Ronald Adama's map, the map that associated was associated with the report, which went through the whole uh, circus to become the final uh, published map. And Ronald had produced about 40 different sketches, uh, experimenting with different ideas, uh, which he drew on his uh, commute from uh, Pleasantville down to New York to do his job as a a lawyer, and you can see he was experimenting with how to indicate the different routes of the uh, system with different colors. And he came up with the idea of alternating colors. So each line would be shown as alternating one color with another color. The problem being that a trunk has multiple routes on it. And if each route has a different color, how do you show those colors on one um, one line. And so he, obviously you want to avoid having two trunks next to each other with the same color at any point. So he had to experiment with a lot of possibilities to find one particular uh, combination that would work. And uh, okay, so two press photographs. Um, at first I thought this is the only information we would have about his map. Uh, then Barley gave me this black and white photocopy and then, okay, well, Maybe we can work out what the final color scheme was. Um, but in 2014, he found in his basement a photograph, a color photograph of the original map. As you may recall, the original map was binned by the uh, TA and it's been lost forever. But we have this photograph zooming in. We can see it's um, legible. You can see what he was doing in this design. Down the bottom, you can see uh, where a red um, root is merging with the yellow one, and then you have red and yellow, red and yellow, and then a green one merges in, and you have red, yellow, green, red, yellow, green. So they're alternating colors within one trunk. So each color represents one end-to-end -end route, but where they run along the same tracks, 
then the colors alternate in a kind of braiding pattern. Uh, that isn't very legible. And so my partner, Reka, um, digitized this. And this is the result. This is a computer digitized version of the photograph. And if we zoom in, we can see this is a representation of that original key. Uh, we've got the yellow, red, and green all merging together. And if we zoom into part of the map, we can see how this works. Uh, we have the express and locals shown as separate lines. And within each of these, we have the alternating colors. So here we have green and yellow for the two different routes on that one, and then black and orange on the adjacent line, um, and so on. So it shows complex maps of information about the different routes. Notice this is rather different from Arthur Weindorf's idea back in 1938, where he drew each colored line separately. And the reason for this is that the TA specifically said in the competition rules, the map must be geographically accurate. And so poor old Bali actually copied out the complete uh, outline of New York and had to compress the information, the route information, in a way that did not distort geography. So he was forced to have this um, very imaginative scheme of alternating colors along each line. Uh, the station names aren't put in because this is just a proof of concept to show this could be done. Now the TA took the view that this wasn't practical because the problem of registration, in order to show clearly all these little blocks of color, you really need to have perfect registration of the color blocks in the, the, the lines. And they felt this wasn't gonna work. It was also gonna be expensive. And so they adopted the idea, the principle of having a color for each end-to-end -end route, that was fine, but not alternating colors. They wanted to have the colors drawn separately as Arthur wind off of them, which obviously meant that the map wasn't geographically accurate anymore. Um, yeah, Raleigh also had little terminals at the end of each uh, line uh, in the relevant color, showing what the uh, designation of the lines are, four and five, two and three, JJ and LL. So this is the uh, sequence of events, and we have the reconstruction of the map here, and in the report, uh, the, the concept of color coding by route, uh, the colored route markers, and the rule of no dot, no stop, all these three concepts went forward to Stanley's design and hence into the final one. Um, this is his definition. Route numbers and letters shall be shown at terminals as indicated on the design submitted herewith. Such route numbers or letters shall have a border of 1 16th inch. And so on. So a very detailed design um, of the thing. Uh, Stanley Goldstein, in order to implement the concept of having a color for each end-to-end -end route, uh, started playing with wires. This is actually a photograph of um, electrical wires pinned onto a board to try to work out uh, a possible scheme, in a way reproducing what Ronnie had already done. Uh, he came up with four prototypes, of which three and four were the best, uh, and he intended to, to, the final choice to be either three or map four, because these were different concepts. Uh, Jerome Adler said, no, 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 uh, let's just merge them together. And so that's what happened. Uh, what were these two concepts? Well, let's have a look at them. Um, so uh, in this one, each um, route is drawn separately. Um, so each trunk is drawn separately. And then each station lists the route stopping there. So here we have S and L, uh, black and red, uh, indicated on each station. And then you can barely see it, but here on the red uh, squares, we have two and four as the two uh, routes that are running in red on that line. So this is a route, sorry, this is a trunk colored map. Uh, here we have a, a red trunk, and there you have two trunks merging together, black and red. The other option, map number four in this scheme, is very similar to Vignelli's later design, where each end-to-end -end route is shown separately. So here we have, rather than having one line in red, we've got two lines, black and red. So each route is drawn separately on the map in its own color. So those are the two ideas. You can either have uh, a trunk-based scheme where each station lists the routes stopping there, or you can have a route colored map where each route is drawn separately as its own line. And um, Goldstein said, well, 
Uh, these are two equally good ideas. Choose which one of them you want. And as I said, uh, the TA uh, merged them together. They did both at the same time. Um, this was, um, I think, map number four, the only known photograph of his complete design. Very blurry, but you can see the notion that uh, each route has its own color. Uh, sadly, this has been lost. We do not have the original. And there, zooming in, you can see a bit of the map. Again, you can see um, how each route will be shown in its own color. And um, yeah, there's a zoom in of one part of it. Yeah, okay, this is just uh, comparing the photograph of the actual prototype with his sketch in his report. So what happened with Jerome Adler's um, result? Um, yes, 1966. Uh, Mr. Leonard Ingalls verbally requested the design division prepare a layout for a four foot by five foot station map to be installed before in service of the initial Christie Street operation in August or September 66. Uh, the layout is based on proposal four submitted by Professor Goldstein. Oh, so here Ingalls is saying, well, let's go for number four. Well, that's a good idea because that's the basically the Vanelli map. Ah, but. What happened next? Uh, here we go. Uh, at his subsequent meeting uh, in January 17th, um, blah, 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 uh, Jerome Adler says, no, let's uh, merge them together, proposal three and proposal four. So Ingalls is overridden, and we have the resulting, uh, many people say, mess of maps three and four combined, which is shown here. And um, we will zoom into that. So this was the, the new map. This is the first map that shows uh, on the subway each route in a separate color, like Arthur Windhoff had proposed back in, in 1938, um, but hadn't been able to implement because he resigned and his map was replaced by the Hankstone map, the three color map. So this is the first time the TA did the scheme of having separate colors. Uh, in a way, it's reinventing what Weindorf's concept had been, uh, but using, as I said, Ronald Adamo's notion of, of having a color for each route. And it is very complex. Let's just zoom in a little bit. Okay, there's the key. Yes, yeah, so the key, you can see each color, um, it, each line, each route has its own color. And yeah, here we go. Wow. Uh, this is described by one senator psychedelic. Uh, each route is uh, represented either by a solid line or a broken line, uh, and w w which in itself would give you all information. All you need are these colored lines, but because of Jerome Adler, uh, each station also lists the route stopping there. So here we have the E and the um, RR stopping at this station, um, and it, it's got double the information you need. Everything is there twice. It's, um, wow. So in terms of the timeline, we've now had the uh, George Salomon map, the Ronald Armour's version, and then 1972, we come into the Vignelli era. So there was a lot of reaction of an adverse nature against the map we've just seen because of its massive complexity, its um, broken lines. And in July 1970, Massimo Vignelli, uh, the director of the New York office of Unimark International, signed a contract with the TA for a new subway map. And he worked with uh, John Charrison, who was basically the designer of it, uh, under his design direction. And this is the prototype in 1970, uh, just the central area of New York, which is presented to the TA. And they said, yep, we like this. So off they went and they produced the full map, which is this. Uh, it was published in August 72. And you can see it's the same concept, in fact, the same colors, as the earlier map, each end-to-end -end route is a different color, but it's streamlined. And you can compare the same area uh, between 67 and 72. It's the same colors, basically, um, but instead of having a box for each station listing the uh, route stopping there, you have dots. And this is it, it, it's been Nelly's um, minimalist idea, uh, his rule, which says no dot, no stop. So like in, in here, where we have um, a dot on the red line, but not on the green or the pink, uh, only the red line stops there. 
And you may recall this is exactly what uh, Arthur Weindorf proposed in 1938. But he didn't have the clout to carry it through. Uh, Arthur Weindorf retired and his map was lost and now sits in the archives of the Transit Museum. Whereas Vignelli uh, was the director of a very prestigious design firm. His map carried the day and has now become probably the most famous map of the New York subway. And as I say, it's the same principle as 67, but streamlined and minimalized. And if we compare the uh, the key for the 67 to map, you see it's pretty much exactly the same colors. Then we move on to a new concept of colors. Well, when I say new, I mean, it's not really new because um, uh, George Salomon had this idea back in 55, but um, things get thrown away and then reinvented. So, um, after Vignelli, uh, there was a new chairman of the uh, MTA, David Unish, who was a senior executive at Macy's and therefore uh, was very oriented towards selling. And at his swearing-in ceremony, David Unish said he was examining any innovative marketing idea. And he said, transit marketing is not too different from marketing shirts or automobiles blah, blah, blah. And he says, people-to-people -people programs will include new maps for the public. So he starts off his new reign as MTA chairman, replacing William Ronan in 1974, uh, with the idea that he wants to have a new map that's going to sell the subway, it's really going to engage with people's imagination. Um, because he didn't think that the Vignelli map was um, good for selling the system. Everyone said it was a beautiful map, very elegant, very great design, but the sense was something new was required to sell the subway. And he hired a um, former colleague, Fred Wilkinson, uh, to work in the TA. And we have the timeline. So we have 1974, David Junich, Fred Wilkinson comes in, and then April 75, the following year, uh, a three-color map in the Hagstorm style was developed, hung on the wall of the staff canteen um, and lost. So we don't know what this map was, but apparently it was very similar to the Hagstorm map. And a number of people were saying at the time, let's ditch the Vignelli map, go back to Hagstrom. Let's go back to three colors for the IRT, BMT and IND, uh, which is not really a workable idea because of the Christie Street connection which merged together the BMT and IND. And really, it's a very retrograde idea to go back to the three color scheme when we had moved forward to the one color per route. But um, July 75, a uh, subway map committee was formed by uh, Fred Wilkinson. Uh, he engages uh, Michael Hertz and uh, Michael Hertz says, yeah, I, I like the idea of going back to Hangstrom. So he says, uh, designs for a geographic map, discarding completely the current color coding system and using colors primarily for delineating and separating the BMT, IND, and IRT routes, despite the fact that these had ceased to exist uh, really back in 1940. I realize that these designations are obsolete and that there are overlaps of service. However, the old nomenclature is still deeply ingrained in most New Yorkers. And this might be a viable approach. So, like I said, this is a, a number of people who were wanting to go back to the 50s, back to uh, Hagstrom, and um, ignore the Christian Street connection, ignore the concept of a minimal map, ignore the notion of uh, root color coding. But that did not win the day. Uh, however, a number of prototypes were produced, such as this. Zoom in, you can see. Uh, the problem that Hertz had in the Christie Street connection, where we have a red line, uh, um, IND line, and then branching off it, we have a green line. So um, that seems rather incongruous to have one color sprouting off another color. It's not a clear way of using color. So um, a number of these products were used in the 76, uh, tested with the public who had various reactions to it. And then John Toronac comes onto the scene. 1974, he is engaged to do uh, this guidebook. 
the uh, bicentennial is coming up. Uh, lots of people are going to come to New York. So we need a guidebook to show people how to get around New York on the subway. So John wrote this book. It's full of information, uh, tourist attractions and whatever. But the key point from our point of view is this, a new map. Um, John was very keen to have a geographic map, but he knew you can't compress 14 different routes in different colors into a geographically accurate Manhattan. What Vignelli had done is to fatten out Manhattan uh, and then draw each line separately. And John said, no, 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 you can't do that. We have to be geographically accurate. So the only way we're going to do it is to draw each line in red. He didn't really want to do that. What he wanted to do is to trunk colors. So Lexington Avenue be one color, 7th Avenue be another color, and so on. But that would involve money. You'd have to recolor the signage on all the stations, recolor the signage on the uh, cars, and at this time, the MTA was broke. Um, people were being laid off. There was deferred maintenance. The city of New York almost became bankrupt. So there was not any money available to recolor the subway. So John couldn't do a, a trunk color scheme. He said, well, the be next best thing is to draw each line in red. Um, Okay, it kind of works. You can show uh, what each route is by the uh, terminals on the side, F1, E and A, but still, it's very difficult to read a map where every line is the same color. Um, but he uh, went through the whole of the subway system. These are some pages from the guidebook, and you can see that the whole thing occupies quite a large number of pages. Not practical to have that on a pocket map but he wasn't thwarted. 1977, uh, Michael Hertz Associates uh, hires Nobus de Rezi, who redrew New York so as to fit onto a square map, as we see here. So it no longer is spread over multiple pages, um, but it is still a red line map. So here we see, uh, a map that was shown in the Sitiana Gallery in 1978, and every line is red, which is confusing, but at least it now fits onto a square map. It's not sped over 14 pages of a guidebook. So it's a step forward, but still, there's a fundamental problem. You can't differentiate immediately where the roots are. You have to look at these little roundels on the side, the four, five, and six on. Uh, that was shown to the public in uh, 78, following which there was the big famous debate in 1978 in the Cooper Union, where Massimo, pardon me, Massimo Vignelli debated with John Tornak about how to draw subway maps. Uh, yeah, Sitiana. Uh, and then there was the, um, this was exhibited in the AGA, AIGA, uh, then we have the Cooper Union debate in April 78. And at the time of the Cooper Union, he said, well, instead of doing all the lines red, why don't we have red and blue? So blue was used for the IRT lines and red for the IND and um, the, the BMT lines. So this was a, a compromise, two colors, a little bit better, but still very hard to read because you don't have a clear separation of the different routes by color as Benelli had. Uh, zooming in, you can see um, how you just got two colors here. So it's, a, it's, it's better than a single color map, but not as clear in terms of root separation as Vignelli's map. So um, John Tronick was kind of stuck at this point in time uh, because he wanted to go to a um, a trunk color scheme and couldn't because it cost money. But in 1978, the federal government uh, reneged on its refusal and provided a large pot of money to the city of New York. And Philip Seth Wagner, who happened by chance to have been assigned as the chairperson of the MTA Aesthetics Committee, she was the, the wife of the former wife of the, uh, the mayor, um, Robert Wagner. And she arranged for some money to be made available. There you go. And she said to John, look, we can help you with some funding, but how would you actually do it? How would you 
design a trunk color scheme rather than Vignelli's root color scheme. And he got uh, Nubus to Renzi to sketch out uh, a number of possibilities. This kind of reminds us of what uh, Raleigh Dharma had been doing, drawing out lots of different permutations to see how you could uh, get a consistent set of colors. And this is one of the sketches that uh, Nubu did in 78. And uh, you can see here how he is uh, using the colors to differentiate the lines uh, based on the trunks, but also choosing colors that don't clash. So you don't have two uh, lines, two trunks with the same color next to each other. And this is the key. Uh, you can see here the different uh, trunks going down, uh, 7th Avenue, Lexington Avenue, 8th Avenue, 6th Avenue, each of which has got its own color. And then the branches off the trunk retain those colors. So that was the concept that uh, was put forward. I was then developed uh, into a more detailed scheme with these particular colors. You notice that these are not the final colors. For example, here, Lexington Avenue is red, and as we now know, it's green. Um, so these were um, a point of development in this uh, concept that happened very quickly uh, between September 78 and March the following year. Once John Tonic had permission to uh, spend money on this new color scheme, it went forward very rapidly, creating uh, a detailed map which uh, shows the concept very well. And yes, here we go. This is um, a, a sheet of paper I came across uh, under a file labeled miscellaneous in the Transit Museum. And it's like a, um, a master directory of different color schemes. Uh, what we see here are the uh, original colors um, of uh, Vignelli, Unimark colors, and then um, the initial suggestion uh, of, of a color scheme. And then there was a, a, a counter proposal that what should be done is to take the flagship color of each trunk and use that to color the whole trunk. What I mean by flagship is the root that has the most stations. And the reason for doing this is to save money. Because if you're gonna change all the stations on a given line, it's gonna cost a lot of money. So if you select a particular uh, route that has the most stations, then you don't have to change so many stations. So purely on a money-saving basis, uh, a new set of colors was proposed uh, and approved and um, it's rather different. So here we see on the left, uh, Nobu's original suggestion of colors. These were then switched around a bit. Um, then Ingalls had the idea of saving money by um, choosing the flagship color, the, co the, the, the color that has the most number of stations in it. Uh, and here we see uh, Unimark's original color scheme, uh, somewhat often quite different. Um, and then finally, we have John Tornex. Um, choice of colors here. And some of these uh, routes uh, did change color. So here it went from brown to green and so on. And some of them um, didn't. So here we have, uh, yeah. So yellow was chosen as the, uh, the main color for this one and then orange for that one. In some cases, um, you couldn't choose the most numerous one, and they had to juggle a little bit, so there's some compromises in choosing the colors, which I won't go into the details of. Um, there was one here, the seven, which was purple, uh, then was suggested to be orange, because orange was the most numerous, and then we went back to, back to purple again, uh, mainly to avoid two colors very similar being side by side. Uh, so here we see um, the original proposal of... Um, blue and purple next to each other. And John said, no, no, you can't have that. So you would be better off having orange and, and uh, blue. Uh, so that's why it became, no, the way around, isn't it? It was orange. Yeah. So where are we now? I'm just zoom through these details. So the end result was you had a new selection of colors uh, representing each of the trunks. And the end result was this map 
here, which is 1979, official subway map. Um, if we zoom in, we can see uh, how it works. Uh, we've got, so as you can see, the um, seven train is now the purple one, uh, whereas the uh, proposal earlier was to have the uh, now this one as being purple, that became orange, to avoid conflict with blue. Uh, and so therefore, seven had to be the purple one, etc. So um, mostly this was based upon uh, choosing the most numerous the the color with the most numerous num color with the most number of stations, uh, but as I said, there were some points where it had to be swapped around to avoid two colors being very similar next to each other. Oh, and that's um, yeah, coming to the end. So it's just a summary. Um, uh, so this is the IT BMT and D, and then we have the um, the different designs there, uh, and that's it. Oh yeah, so just to summarize, we have sort of two colors, then we go to root colors and three colors, and then root colors and then trunk colors. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. That is the story of the coloring of the New York subway matter. Well, Peter, thank you so much. What a fascinating look into how these maps have come about to carry the colors that they do. and. Uh, for me, it was I, I learned a tremendous amount, and I'm just I'm enormously impressed with the thoughtfulness that, that went into your research and all the considerations of how to portray such a complex system as the New York subway. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. If anyone has questions, we would encourage you to put those into the Q&A function. Uh, the chat we like for comments, uh, but for questions, please drop those into the Q&A. It's a little bit easier for us to manage uh, on the back end to make sure that we uh, get all those questions asked. Uh, I, I would like to start off with one for you, Peter, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Uh, if you could just say a little bit about how you got interested in the New York City subway maps to begin with. Ah, well, um, by accident. Um, back in the 90s, I was working uh, in London near a uh, a market, um, which had a world food market inside it. And, uh, this is a Spitalfield market. And um, a colleague of mine wanted to buy some lunch, but they only took cash, didn't take credit cards, so I lent him a few quid. And he said the next day, do you want the money back for a mystery gift? And of course, I went for the mystery gift, which turned out to be a 1958 map of the London Tube, uh, held together by scotch tape and that got me started in collecting the maps because i thought wow this is amazing um and then i branched off from london to new york berlin and so on um about six books or more than that now have been published on the london tube map so I, there was no point trying to do another book on that but mm -hmm. nobody had published anything on the new york subway map mm -hmm. so okay it, it's um it's a bit more distant than berlin but i don't speak german or paris or french but new yorkers speak english so uh, going through the archives was uh, um, feasible. I could read the documents and, and uh, memos and interview people. So that's how it got started. And then once it got started, it was originally meant to be just a single article. Um, but it became, it was clear there's a lot more information there, a lot more fascinating stories. And then I started meeting up with the designers uh, of the subway system going back to the uh, 60s. Uh, Valentin Armour, for example, has been hugely helpful um, in his, his enormous memories and also the Pepsi is in his, his uh, attic. And then just hunting around to Florida and Texas to meet the designers who've often retired and left New York. Um, it's been a fantastic adventure. It, it, uh, I'm driven forward by um, the urge to, to get the, these books published. The idea is to have nine books. Um, it hasn't got very far in that yet, but uh, they are in preparation. Some of them exist as InDesign files, and at some point, hopefully not in the too distant future, they'll actually be printed uh, as books to share this information. Hmm. Well, Elrond, you're muted. Uh, Peter, well, thank you for me as well. Uh, there's one question I see in the chat that asks, what happened after 1980? And what is today's map like? Also, did London <laughs> go through a similar change? 
Yeah, what happened after 1980 is it carried on the same um, scheme as, as John Tonic for a number of years. Uh, and then a, a, um, a new concept was put forward of having um, the express and local tracks drawn separately. Uh, but that wasn't uh, adopted, even though it was a very ingenious scheme. Um, and then, so it went back to the uh, Tornak notion, uh, which it essentially still is as the uh, so-called standard map, as the MTA referred to it. It's a geographic map, uh, one color for each uh, trunk. But um, in 2011, the Vignelli standard map was brought back um, online. Uh, and the reason is very pragmatic that if you want to show the weekend um, outages, which routes have been uh, stopped on the weekend for engineering works, it's hard to do that with a geographic map. You have to actually write down either crossing off or writing there that the number four route um, wasn't running. Whereas if you separate them out, so in Lexington Avenue, for example, if you separate out Lexington Avenue into three, three lines, all green, then you can gray out individual or ghost out, as they call it now, ghost out certain routes to indicate they're not running. Um, and so that's why they brought back the schematic Vignelli style design uh, online. And that has grown on them. A lot of people within the MTA really like that design, but other people within the MTA don't. Uh, and so there is a bit of a, a tension within the MTA um, as to which way to go. Um, and that has been the case for a few years now. So we don't know how that is going to pan out. Um, there's also been a move towards electronic maps. Uh, so it may well be that uh, going forwards, we will have a geographic map in electronic style and a diagrammatic style in the Vignelli style running in parallel and people can choose which they want. Um, so it, it's really an exciting time. It's like going back to the 70s when we had this huge explosion of activity. Um, and now, uh, we have, again, uh, a sense of debate and discussion, and nobody really knows what the map's going to look like. We've had a couple of questions come in about Robert Moses and his impact, uh, particularly in the maps from your uh, perspective, but uh, anything else you might want to say about, about him as well, I think uh, would be of interest. Um, well, he didn't really influence the subway map much. Um, I mean, he uh, the road map, obviously, he had a big influence on, um, but it didn't really change the subway or, or the subway map. Um, I know people have got radically different views about whether he's a hero or a villain. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but in terms of the subway map, no, uh, he, it's, he didn't um, didn't get involved in that. Hmm, okay. Peter, when you were doing your research for this, uh, I was particularly struck by how you were able to sort of parse through some of the internal discussions, uh, you know, within the within the various uh, managers and, and others to discuss aspects of different maps and what ended up getting presented. And and at mm -hmm. least from my perspective, some of some of that information seems like it would be pretty difficult to to find. How how did you go about doing that? Uh, the laborious process of going through box after box in the Transit Museum. Um, uh, they have an enormous amount of material, um, but not everything. Uh, some of the stuff uh, had to come from private hands. A lot of the people who had worked uh, on the uh, subway map committee um, had taken papers home with them and are still there in manila folders in their attic. And um, they've been very helpful. Um, to, to, to offer me the information, to let me take photocopies and scan in the maps. Uh, so it's a combination of finding amongst the huge amount of material, the few slips of paper um, that are relevant. Uh, and that uh, one sheet I showed of the list of the colors, um, I almost fell off my chair when I found that. I thought, wow, God, this is incredible. Because uh, John Tonka had told me that there had been a decision about that time choosing the different color schemes. Uh, and then to find actual documentary proof, that is exactly what happened. Um, yeah, another great find was a, 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 an audio recording of Phyllis Sir Wagner in Columbia University the day after a meeting with John Tornak, where it was decided to go ahead with the color scheme. Uh, what a, an incredible coincidence that the, the very next day, fresh in our mind, is a recording of the uh, conversation that taking place. So it, it's... Um, 
a lot of chance, but also a lot of frustration because a huge amount of material has been lost. Um, for example, in the Unimark office, almost everything was thrown away when the office closed and Benelli went off to form his own company. Basically, everything went in the skip. Wow. So um, almost all of the original sketches and ideas and memos disappeared. Uh, luckily, Joan Charleston, who was the actual designer working under Massimo, retained that choice up, which I did show, um, is now hanging on her living room wall. Um, so, yeah, it's it, a mixture of, of chance and uh, loss of opportunities and, and uh, really uh, very, very sad loss of masses of material. Robert, anything else on here? I was, uh, I don't see any other questions on the chat, but Peter, I'm just curious, are there any other, this was just so staggering in its depth and I'm just blown away by this. Are, are there any comparable studies of, of other transit maps to this degree that you know of? I guess the tube may be one of those, but. Yeah, the, the, the London tube, um, because it's iconic. Um, <laughs> A lot of people have been studying it and, and diving in. Unfortunately, they've got the same problem that New York has, that most of the original uh, memos and correspondence have disappeared. Um, so there's just a few fragments, uh, but people have been trying to piece together information as best they can. Um, but it's, again, it's a frustrating process. And, and there, there have been a few studies of other maps. Um, Berlin's got some studies, but um, no, I, I, I haven't seen any other um, really systematic and deep study of a, a, a metro map or, or subway map. Um, mm. and, and really, I, I feel very um, honored that uh, so many of the original designers have um, assisted me, have been so generous with their time and information. It's been right. yeah. 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 Fabulous. Fabulous. Boy. I do see in the chat, someone hopes that somebody is doing a similar effort for Tokyo. So I guess that would be. <laughs> I hope so too, because I can't read Japanese, so <laughs> I'm certainly not going to do it. Um, yeah, I, I would love to. I mean, I've seen some of the uh, 1960s and 70s maps of the Tokyo subway um, with a number of concepts taken from London. It's interesting how some of the design concepts feed across different countries. Um, obviously, there's certain influence of London to New York and other places. Um, but yeah, it is intriguing to see how ideas move across national boundaries. Mm -hmm. Very much. Oh, wonderful. Well, Peter, thank you again for sharing just an utterly fascinating presentation with us. We really appreciate it. And, and, and just thank you so much for your willingness to, to present your work to our audience today. It's absolutely uh, my pleasure. I've enjoyed it. Thank oh, you. So have we, as I've been our privilege. Very Thanks, much. everyone, uh, for, for tuning in on the uh, lunch hour or even a morning time slot on the West Coast. Uh, this program will be posted to our YouTube page in a week or two so that others who weren't able to get time off from work today uh, can go back and see it there later. And uh, as I said, our, our next uh, live Zoom program will be on Tuesday, February 20th, and that's going to feature the uh, our Fred Springer collection. Again, one of our first uh, big photography collections we accepted at the center. And I'm excited to share some of the selections and history of, of that collection with you. So look forward to that. We'll be opening registrations for that on our website in the coming weeks. Uh, registrations will also be opening uh, next week for our Conversations 2024 conference in uh, Lake Forest, Illinois, and also at the Illinois Railway Museum in Union on Friday afternoon and evening to kick that off. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun and, and look forward to that there. We'll have additional Zoom programs uh, every other month, except for June uh, when we have our live conference. We'll continue the monthly Zoom program series. Otherwise, look forward to seeing all of you out there in the not too distant future. So thanks again for tuning in and joining us. Happy New Year, and we'll see you out there again soon.